When Eagle Dynamics announced they were updating the core of DCS to use Vulkan, the community clung on to two words, improved performance. But what exactly is the Vulkan API and how much better performance will we get out of it? I did some reading to answer those questions and thought I would share what I found with you guys. Let's take a look. To understand what Vulkan is, we need to get a good idea of what it's replacing. In this case, that's the DirectX API that DCS currently uses to access your computer's graphic hardware. This API came about as a result of a lot of game development studios telling Microsoft they wouldn't be writing games for Microsoft's upcoming Windows 95 release because it was just too difficult to write gaming code for the system. Microsoft's answer was to consolidate a set of software tools for talking to a computer's hardware into a single developer-friendly package. That package was DirectX, and it consisted of a family of APIs for accessing a desktop's graphics hardware, audio, network connections, and more. This was especially attractive to game developers because at the time, they had to write drivers for every piece of hardware they wanted to make compatible with their game. That meant game developers had to split their time between making their game and writing drivers. With DirectX, Microsoft was now offering to write all those drivers for the game developers so they could spend more time on their game. It also meant that as more capable graphics hardware came out, they could use the same API to take advantage of it. Microsoft released a steady stream of updates to support all the new technology that came out after DirectX's initial release. But this came with the cost. Like with all software, over time it accumulated bloat. Game developers saw room for improvement when it came to reducing the overhead of the API. This is also what the developers of OpenGL, a competing API to DirectX, also saw. So they began work on a replacement for their OpenGL platform, which sought to address those performance problems. And that's how they ended up creating the Vulkan API. Vulkan is a reimagining of how graphics APIs are built. Instead of being a monolithic suite of software, it's made up of optional layers. As a game developer, you can run them all if you want, or take out some from the final product that you only need in your development studio, like debugging and testing layers that your customers won't ever see. That alone frees up some CPU resources. In these games, simply switching to Vulkan increased frame rates between 5 and 15%. Now I'm sure you're probably thinking, that's it? I thought it'd be more. It actually can be, and that's because Vulkan offers some tools to help game developers squeeze some extra performance out of your computer's hardware. We have to remember that both DirectX and OpenGL were created in an era when single CPU systems dominated the consumer market. So they were optimized for a single pipeline of work. Everything is kept in a single space known as a context, and when you have just one context, it makes it difficult for other cores to reach in and take a part out. Think of it like trying to pull one of the ingredients out of an omelet after you've mixed them all together. It's not going to work out very well. If you want to do something with each of them, it's best to have your cooks work with each ingredient before mixing them all together. That way you can have them all working on parts of the recipe instead of having just one doing all the work while the other stand by idle. A game like DCS is already set up to split up tasks this way. When I ran this analysis, I found that DCS already creates over 50 threads. But the problem is they're stuck in that single context, which is why you see a situation like this where one or two pipelines end up doing most of the work. With that single context, you can only do so much separation of the threads. Newer graphics APIs do have a way to overcome this. What Vulkan does is give developers a tool called the command buffer. This is where each GPU instruction, the command, is kept in a list until it needs to be processed. Vulkan also allows developers to create more of these command buffers so each core can have its own. The buffer then hands out commands as pipelines become available. Using our omelet analogy, you're keeping your eggs, ham, and pepper separated until there's a cook available. In the end, you still get your omelet, but now you can utilize more of your cooks and your kitchen can create more omelets per hour. So if you're in a situation like this where you're playing DCS and you see a pipeline maxed out with others barely working, then Vulkan provides the opportunity to spread out that work more evenly. However, it's not automatic. The game developers do need to write code optimized for their game to get the most out of it. In this example, we see only about 17% of the total possible output of the CPU being used by DCS. 
And that's because so much of the work is being piled onto just one pipeline. Theoretically, we could get more than five times the current performance if the entire CPU output was used. Realistically, though, we should expect less than 100% in a typical gameplay session. But even going up to just 34% utilization would double our frame rates in this scenario. Now there's one more thing I wanted to mention that isn't explicitly Vulkan, but should be good news for VR users. And it goes back to this word that was mentioned in a previous newsletter. RenderGraph isn't a new API. It's actually a way of building the software pipeline that takes the data in your computer's memory and then transforms it into something that goes to your monitor. In most games, a custom pipeline is created that's very rigid and inflexible. That's because game studios don't want to spend extra developer time creating something modular when they know that a game will be out for just a year or two before the next game in that line comes out. It's easier to just make something disposable with whatever is currently available. But DCS is a special case. It's been going over 10 years without any signs of stopping, and in some cases it really shows. So the developers needed a way to easily bring in newer APIs, and for that, you need a pipeline that's easy to modify. That's what a render graph pipeline is. It's flexible and lets you pick and choose what components you use in each step. In a render graph system, you keep components in a pool and just pull out the ones you need. You can bring them into your graphics pipeline whenever you want and wherever you want. So you can rearrange things to fit what works best for you. In fact, you could rearrange the entire pipeline between each frame being rendered if you wanted to. That way you could customize it to cut out the parts that aren't needed for a particular frame, but bring them back when they are needed. You could save a lot of processing power with that level of control and some good coding. You could even keep multiple APIs in the pool too. So you can have both DirectX and Vulkan in the render graph and choose which one you use. In fact, the dev team even indicated they would be doing that here in the last update. One other powerful feature of a render graph architecture is the ability to loop back around on one of the nodes to do that part again. In a fixed graphics pipeline, you would have to run the entire process again. But with the render graph, you can just reuse the parts you need. For VR users, this is great news. With a traditional rendering process, if you go from a monitor to a VR headset, your graphics pipeline needs to do twice the work. This is because VR is showing two separate views that are separated slightly to replicate stereoscopic vision, just like in human eyes. With the same hardware now dealing with two pipelines worth of work, you can expect to see roughly half the frame rate of a single pipeline behind a monitor. Using a render graph, we wouldn't need to rerun the entire pipeline. We could just loop back through the parts we need without the overhead of doing the whole thing twice. Of course, it won't ever be as fast as a purely single pipeline, but it'll still be an improvement. Now the dev team is bringing in multiple technologies at once to improve performance, and this is important because their gains will be compounded. Let's go through some hypothetical numbers to give you an idea of why this is important. Earlier we said simply switching to Vulkan can give 5 to 15% extra performance. Let's call it an even 10%. So if you currently get 80 FPS on a monitor and 40 with VR, then you would see these increase to 88 and 44. Not too shabby, but we can do better. So let's say that using Vulkan's command buffer to spread out threads across the CPU adds another 40% to that number. That would bring us to 120 and 60 frames per second. Now that's more like it. If refactoring our graphics pipeline into a render graph brings VR performance to halfway between those numbers, then that would make it 90 FPS. That's actually higher than single screen performance before all the enhancements. If we see gains like this, it'll really change the experience for most players. These numbers are purely hypothetical, but they do illustrate the power of compounding performance gains. We won't know exactly what the new performance will be like until the new graphic system is released. But I hope this video helped to give you an idea of what is possible, and I appreciate you taking the time to watch it. If you're interested in learning more, I'll leave links to some of the research I did for this video down in the description.